uh friends uh, good evening and uh, welcome to the 160th uh webinar which we have been running continuously for the last uh you know three years now and uh, this uh, has become one of the most important uh activity uh the students are looking forward to every wednesday because they know that every wednesday from seven onwards till nine the webinar is going to be there all the webinars which are uh conducted here are put up on YouTube and we see that there are a lot of uh, hits on YouTube for, uh, you know, for, for the postgraduate students who, uh, you know, like to learn more and more about the subject. Today's uh, topic is uh, unique, uh, unique in the sense that uh, this is one topic which is, uh, which is very different. We normally discuss NSEA, we discuss everything right from physiology, anatomy, pharmacology, uh, the effect of drugs and, you know, lots of things. Uh, this is not uh, hardcore, but this is something uh, which is absolutely integral to any research. I mean, research methodology is, is uh, absolutely essential to know uh, these days. When I was a student, there was hardly any stress laid on these topics, but now it's becoming more and more important because uh, there is a lot of stress on uh, research and research methodology uh, these days. Of what research is, it is uh, basically the continuous search in the pursuit of truth with the help of a study, investigation, observation, comparison, and or experimentation. So that's what research is all about. It is a quest for knowledge through diligent search or investigation or experimentation aimed at discovery and interpretation of the new knowledge. And research methodology is a method of investigation or the course of critical inquiry leading to discovery of facts or information which increases our understanding of the human health or the ill health and the factors that modify it. It sounds a little complex, but uh, we have very learned faculty who is going to sort the things out for us. We have four topics which uh, will be uh, delivered by <clears throat> experienced faculty. First is generating hypothesis and research question to, to identify what are we going to have research on. Then what are our aims, objectives and outcome measures of the research that we'll be conducting. Introduction and review of literature is something which is, uh, again is very important because until unless we know what has been the previous uh, research on a particular topic, only then we can go further. And then the common study designs, and that would complete the research methodology. And for uh, this, we have two very experienced, very learned faculty members as moderators. One is, uh, you know, both are very dear friends, Dr. R. S. Rothela. He is professor and head uh, anesthesiology at uh, department uh, at uh, at the UCMS and the GTB hospital. Uh, he's ex-medical director of the GTB hospital and ex-treasurer of Delhi branch of ISA and is a joint secretary for the National Association of Critical Care Medicine and associate editor for the Asian Archives of Anesthesiology and Resuscitation. He has more than 50 publications and he is reviewed for various journals and has supervised more than 50 students for their thesis. His area of interest is regional anesthesia and AB management. And the other uh, moderator that we have is Dr. Asha Tyagi, another very well known name. She's uh, again a direct professor there in the Department of Anesthesiology, anesthesiology at UCMS and GTB Hospital, uh, Delhi. And she has uh, over 100 indexed publications. She's a section editor of General of Anesthesiology and Clinical Pharmacology. And she's also the associate editor for BMC Anesthesiology, which uh, is an international journal. And besides that, she's viewed for several international uh, national journals. Her, her area of interest is the critical care and obstetric anesthesia research methodology and, uh, in anesthesia. We have to, thus we have to very, uh, very learned uh, faculty members who would be uh, moderating this session. So I'm pleased to hand over the session to both of them. Over to you, Dr. Rotela and Dr. Asha. Kindly proceed on. Uh, thank you, Dr. Baljeet. Uh, now I invite our first speaker, Dr. Rashmi Salutra. Dr. Rashmi Salutra 
She is a professor in the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care, USMA GTF Hospital. She has published around 60 uh, research papers in national and international journals. She is IRCF and AHA certified instructor in research station. She wrote approximately six uh, uh, chapters in the books. She is also a reviewer of index and uh, uh, national and international journals. Her area of interest are the resuscitation, airway, regional anesthesia, obstetric anesthesia, and perioperative uh, care. Now she will talk on generating hypothesis and research questions. Now, Dr. Rashmin Salutra, please. Thank you so much, sir, for the kind words and introduction. So today's topic that I would be talking upon is research question and hypothesis. So this flowchart will tell you where the research question and hypothesis actually fit in a research methodology. The first step to design any research is that you observe a lacuna in the literature and then you raise some questions. So a research question is the second step in the scientific methods. And the third step is generating a hypothesis. So I'll go through the research question first. So a research question, as the name suggests, is a question. And it is an idea which we want to examine during our study. It guides the research paper or the thesis or dissertation that you're planning to do. And it addresses the perceived knowledge deficit and aims to expand the existing body of knowledge. Research questions are mainly of three types. They can be causal questions which compare two or more phenomena. For example, does the amount of calcium in the diet of elementary school children affect the number of cavities they have per year? It can be purely a descriptive research where the question seeks to describe a phenomena. For example, how do college students, how often do college students use Twitter? Then they can be comparative where you are trying to compare difference between two or more variables. For example, what is the difference in caloric intake of high school girls and boys? Now research question has to be framed in six steps. First of all, you choose a broad topic and which the target audience may be interested in. Second is you research your topic a little bit and then you decide on which population you would like to do that research on. Then you pose the right questions and you test whether your questions that you are posing are the correct questions or not and they are good questions or not. So you examine the research question as the fifth part and in the end you brainstorm the possible outcomes and you come up with a hypothesis. So we will go through each of these six steps one by one and we will understand how we will get to a good research question. So here there is a broad topic in front of you. So it is, does lifestyle influence the post-operative complication rate? But it's a very broad topic. So we do not know which are the exact variables that we are wanting to compare. So we will now narrow it down and we will try to find now uh, a better research question would be, does chronic smoking have an effect on the post-operative pulmonary complications? So now you have defined which lifestyle uh, factor you are trying to study, that is chronic smoking. And post-operative complication rate also you have narrowed down to a little bit uh, less narrow, a less broader topic. So you have come to post-operative pulmonary complications. So those are the two things that you are planning to study. Still, they are not very precise. So to get on to precise, we go and narrow down our research further. And then we come up to a question which says, does chronic smoking increase the risk of post-operative re-intubation in patients operated upon for upper abdominal surgeries under GA? So this is a more specific question where we know what would be our aim. Probably it will guide us what we would like to do and help us design a study design. 
So we have covered the first three steps of framing a research question. Now we go on to the fourth one, which is ask the right questions. So we want to know whether the question that we have posed is good or bad. To know that we have the finer criteria. So finer is an acronym for feasible, interesting, novel, ethical, and relevant. So F stands for finer, feasible. Feasibility, we need to start, uh, we need to find out what research question we have posed. Will it be possible to do at our, uh, with the resources that we have at our place or not? In terms of time, money, number of subjects, technical expertise, etc. Then it should be interesting because if it is not interesting, you will be not uh, wanting to finish the research and bring it to an end. It should be novel because our aim in the end of any research is to publish it in a good leading journal with a good impact factor. So novelty is a very important aspect. It should be ethical. So we should not be doing any harm to the patients or the subjects on which we are doing the research. And we should always seek an institutional review board approval. Lastly, it should be relevant to scientific knowledge, clinical and health policy, because in case you supposing you are trying to research smallpox which is not a relevant issue these days so it will not have any impact and uh, you will not be able to do a good research because it is not relevant to the current knowledge another way to look at a question and examine whether it's a good question or not is the pico model pico again is an acronym where p stands for patient or population or problem I is for intervention, C is for comparator agent, and O is for outcome. So these are the basic four aspects which should be there in your research question. Additionally, you can have T, which is the time frame, or you can have S, which is the study design. So these can also be part of your research question. So it becomes a PCORTS model. Now, I uh, would request you all to please pay attention and uh, use your chat boxes to identify the P to PICO elements in these questions. So the examples, uh, example is in front of you. I want you all to please identify PICO elements here. Is diet control better than exercise for weight loss in obese adult males? So coming up with the answers, population here is obese adult males. Intervention is diet control. Then comparator agent is exercise and weight loss is the outcome measure. So it is a good research question. Now coming up with a second example, are the characteristics of subarachnoid block of isobaric rupivacaine altered with the addition of dexmedetomidine in patients undergoing surgeries for fractured neck of femur? So here the population is Patients who are undergoing surgery for fractured neck of femur. I is subarachnoid block. C is isobaric rupivacaine with and without dexmedetomidine. And outcome is block characteristics. I hope you are able to understand what is the PICO model. I will further elaborate this with a few more examples. Is intravenous administration of dexmedetomidine superior to esmolol for suppression of hemodynamic responses to tracheal intubation in hypertensive patients? So here, population is hypertensive patients. Intervention is tracheal intubation. And comparator agents are dexmedetomidine and esmolol. And the outcome that you are looking for is suppression of hemodynamic responses to intubation. Another example, which drug provides better intubating conditions for awake fiber optic bronchoscopy, fentanyl or nalbufen? So population is patients who are undergoing awake fiber optic bronchoscopy. Intervention is also awake fiber optic bronchoscopy. Comparator agent, fentanyl and nalbufen. And outcome is intubating conditions. So this is an example here. You have you see that what was the outcome of critically ill sepsis patients admitted in GTB hospital in 2022? So this example outlines a date also. So this is the PICO plus 
time frame, Picot model. In the next example, is there a reduction in mortality due to sepsis with the implementation of sepsis care six bundle in the trauma center of GTB hospital? So population, patients who are coming to trauma center of GTB hospital and suffering from sepsis. Intervention is implementation of sepsis care six bundle. Comparator agent is before and after the implementation of sepsis six bundle. So what is the mortality? And outcome is the mortality. So now we have checked for the first four, in fact, the first five elements of research question. And after this, we would like to brainstorm the possible outcomes. And that brings us to the hypothesis of a particular study. So a hypothesis is a plausible answer to the research question. It is a statement created by researchers when they speculate upon the outcome of a research or an experiment. And they are intelligent hunches based on previous body of knowledge. So this clearly states that if there is no previous body of knowledge, that study would not have a hypothesis. It would just have a research question. And research question essentially is a part of each and every research. But when you have a previous research already done, then you can generate a hypothesis. But without a background research, a hypothesis generation is not possible. So now we'll go on to a few examples that we took previously for the research questions and we will frame hypothesis for the same. So the research question we had previously was, does lifestyle influence the post-op complication rate? A hypothesis for the same can be lifestyle affects complication rate in the post-op period. However, this just as we saw that the research question that we posed over here was a very broad research question. Similarly, the hypothesis is also very general and has no direction. So if you pose a better question, which we did while framing the question, it was, does chronic smoking have an effect on the post-op pulmonary complications? A hypothesis for the same would be post-op pulmonary complications are more in chronic smokers. So it has a little bit of direction, but it is still not testable. So you see that it is important to have the right question to get a right hypothesis. So the best question out of the three was initially that we saw was, does chronic smoking increase the risk of reintubation in patients operated for upper abdominal surgery under GA? A hypothesis for the same would be chronic smoking increases the incidence of post-op reintubation after upper abdominal surgery. Now, this is more specific because it is talking about one possible outcome. It is also testable because it is giving you that we want to read the, uh, we want to know the incidence of post-op reintubation. And it has a direction because we have said that we want to see the increase in the incidence. So this is how a good research question will be, you will be able to generate a good hypothesis as well. So now the hypothesis is also of different kinds out of which the most commonly used ones are the null hypothesis and the alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis states that there is no relationship between the groups with respect to a variable. This is what we usually start with because we want to be unbiased at the beginning of the study. So a null hypothesis would look like this. There is no difference between the performance of college students who attend or do not attend lectures. So we are not talking about uh, the difference between the two. We assume that there is no difference. An alternate hypothesis, on the other hand, states that there will be a significant difference between the two groups. An alternate hypothesis can further be divided into two subtypes. One is one-sided or directional hypothesis and the other one is two-sided or non-directional hypothesis. So we get back to our previous null hypothesis and then we try to frame the alternate hypothesis for the same. So the question is there is no difference between the performance of college students who attend or do not attend lectures. This was the null or the H0. Now we want to generate the H1. 
So a one-sided H1 would be college students who attend lectures perform better than those who do not attend lectures because it stays better. So it is going in one direction. So it is one-sided hypothesis. The other thing is two-sided, which says that college students who attend lectures perform differently. So it can be better or it can be worse than those who do not attend lectures. Coming on to a few examples. Video laryngoscopes are better than Macintosh laryngoscope for intubation and cervical spine injury. So this is H1, that is the alternate hypothesis, and this is one directional. Another right, uh, way of writing the same hypothesis can be video laryngoscopes are comparable to Macintosh for intubation in cervical spine injury. So this is a null hypothesis. Second example, consumption of black coffee affects wellness. So effects, so you do not know whether it in, improves or it goes for the bad. So this is a non-directional. Consumption of black coffee improves wellness. This is one directional. And consumption of black coffee does not improve wellness or has no effect on the wellness could be a null hypothesis. I hope the difference is clear to everybody. So with this, we have come to an end of framing the research question and coming to a good hypothesis. So in the end, I would like to say that every research, whether it is qualitative or quantitative, has a research question which ends with a question mark. It is inter inquisitive or interrogative in nature. It helps in deciding your research design. A hypothesis, on the other hand, is a statement which is an intelligent hunch written as an assertive sentence. It is used when there is enough evidence available in the chosen field of research and it is applicable to only quantitative researches mainly. Last example, what is the prevalence of TB amongst medical and non-medical staff working in GTBH is an example of a research question because it ends with a question mark. And an intelligent hunch would be a hypothesis which goes as follows. The prevalence of TB amongst medical staff is not different from the non-medical staff working in GTPH. Thank you so much for a patient listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rashmi. Thank you, sir. Now, I, I invite uh, our second speaker, Dr. Alpna. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, I invite Dr. Alpna. Uh, Dr. Alpna is a professor of medicine in University College of Medical Sciences. She has uh, published uh, several research papers in, in indexed in uh, national and international journals. And she has written uh, many chapters and medical books. And she is the in charge of the, uh, our uh, Professor in charge of the dialysis services and antiretroviral center of UCMA GTB hospital. And she is also a member of our uh, medical education unit of UCMS. And her area of interest are nephrology, HIV medicine, and medical education. And she will uh, talk on aims, objectives, and outcome measures. Dr. Arna, please. Thank you, sir, for the kind introduction. At the onset, I would thank uh, Team ICA for inviting me for this webinar and acknowledge our medical education unit as this presentation is a composite of efforts towards medical education unit UCMS initiative to facilitate sessions on research methodology. So most of you would be uh, conversant with this picture and you would identify it as being taken from a legendary, as, a, as depicting a legendary tale from uh, Mahabharata, where Guru Donacharya tried to test his pupils on their marksmanship in archery. So I would take uh, this picture as an aid to tell about uh, the aims, objectives, and outcomes, which is the topic under discussion for next 20 minutes of ours. So the question here is, why was this activity undertaken by Guru Donacharya? So the answer would be, one of the answers could be to assess the marksmanship of pupils of Guru Dronacharya. 
Then the next question which can be asked, how would he assess the marksmanship of his pupils? So uh, as uh, is known to all of us, this was by shooting the bird's eye, which was perched on a tree. And we could add on more specifics to this how by saying that a bow and arrow had to be used and the bird had to be shot from a distance of 10 meters. And it should be the eye of the bird should be shot in three attempts. The third thing is, did how meet why? Which means, uh, how are we going to assess whether by shooting the bird's eye, we can find who is the best marksman? So the percentage of pupils who could shoot in first attempt could be one of the ways in which we can see uh, if the marksmanship of the pupils of the guru was up to mark or not. So this why, how, and uh, whether the how met why, these are the three things which we call the aim, the objective, and the outcome. So the number of objectives could be many to uh, attain this aim of assessing the marksmanship. And as many number of objectives are there to assess this aim, there could be n number of outcomes. So an aim uh, is a very broad term which states the purpose or the intent to do something. As we saw in the previous example, so the purpose or the intent was to assess the marksmanship. Uh, there could be certain examples, not from uh, the legends, but from our own fields of medicine. So one example could be to study the efficacy of zinc supplementation in treatment of severe pneumonia in under five children. The second could be to study the role of antihypertensive non-compliance in cardiovascular mortality. So as you see, uh, the aim is practically a restatement of the topic of your thesis or your dissertation. So the topic of uh, the title of the thesis could be efficacy of zinc uh, supplementation in under five children in treatment of severe pneumonia. So what we have done is a restatement of the title by adding to study, to evaluate, or to, uh, uh, you know, to uh, assess the efficacy. So uh, the next question is also the same to study the role of antihypertensive non-compliance in cardiovascular mortality. So this again shows that we have just modified our thesis title and we have restated it to just say with the action verb that is to study. So the title here could be role of antihypertensive non-compliance in cardiovascular mortality. Now what does this aim lack? What does these examples or these statements lack? They do not tell us how are we going to assess either the role or the efficacy. So these are very broad terms which are just stating the purpose or our intention. For this reason, what we require are objectives. Now, for one single aim, there could be multiple objectives which we can arrange as objective one, two, and three, because there are different ways in which you can assess the same uh, aim or you can answer your research question. So objectives can be many, aim is singular. Now, how do we arrange these objectives? That is what the question is. So the objectives largely, the primary objective should be one. That primary objective should be able to satisfactorily answer your aim and should satisfactorily uh, answer the research question which you have put up. And the rest of the uh, objectives could be pulled under the heading of secondary objectives. So it's best to have one primary objective which can even guide uh, about your sample design and with, uh, the, the study design and your sample size and the rest could be under secondary objectives. Now, objectives uh, should be small. They should be specific. These are basically stepping stones to realize your aim. So they should be very specific. As uh, Dr. Rashmi in her talk had told that the, the characteristics of a good research question you uh, were the finer elements, F-I-N-E-R. So is the case with objectives. What we need is uh, specific targets, small targets, and by achieving these small targets, the aim should be partially, ideally uh, fully fulfilled, but if not fully fulfilled, at least partially fulfilled. So there is only one primary objective and there can be many secondary objectives. As for the finer criteria for a research question, we have the smart objectives or 
the characteristics of objective should be smart. So what does smart stand for? S is again specific. It is very important that you need to spell out very clearly what you are going to do by use of certain action words. And uh, these action words should clearly tell how are you going to achieve your aim. Second is measurable. And measurable means that there should be a clear way of evaluation, whether the steps which you have undertaken or the objectives which you have stated would be clearly evaluating your aim. Then they should be achievable. It should be within your scope. You cannot have a research question which is beyond your scope, which is beyond your resources. So it should be possible to accomplish or attain that particular objective uh, within your limited resources. And then again, it should be relevant. Relevance means it should pertain to your uh, job. It should pertain to the work which you do at your place. It should not be something which is not directly related to the kind of work which you, day, uh, which you do in your day-to-day -day practice. And then it should be time-bound. So you have to state when you will get it done and you should be specific on the time and uh, the date by which that work should be completed. And this is very important, especially when it comes to postgraduate thesis or dissertations. And it may be a little more relaxed when it comes to uh, PhD thesis or dissertations. I would again stress on the M because this M or the ability of your objective is what we call outcomes. These outcomes are basically quantitative estimates of whether your objective could meet your so coming to outcomes, these outcomes are not verbs. These are basically quantitative data, quantitative measurements, which you have gathered by way of doing your study. They are expressed in quantifiable units, and these are a measure or an evaluation tool of your aims and objectives. So as there were primary objectives and secondary objectives, so in alignment with these objectives, we have the primary outcome or outcomes and the secondary outcome or outcomes. So ideally for a primary objective, there should be a primary outcome because we are uh, quite clear that ideally uh, a single primary objective should be best suited for a study. So this is the most important measurement that you're going to gather by way of your study. And this should be in complete alignment with your primary objective. This would assess the direct effect of your study intervention, whereas the secondary outcomes could be as many as the secondary objectives. So if you have three secondary objectives, you would have three secondary outcomes aligned to those objectives. But uh, these secondary outcomes, please do not confuse that you, that you can decide later what would be your secondary outcome. These primary outcomes and secondary outcomes, all uh, they need to be spelled at the initiation of your uh, project. So secondary outcomes are not secondary in the sense that they can be thought of later. They are a part of a pre-specified analysis plan. So you need to chalk out your secondary objectives as well as your secondary outcomes to evaluate your secondary objectives at the start of your uh, research uh, protocol. And this uh, would provide supportive information about effect of intervention. So at best, it is uh, a nice to you know uh, restrain yourself to framing just a maximum of three to four secondary objectives the rest of uh, whatever sub analysis results which you get that can be presented in your thesis but not as part of secondary outcomes they can be a byproduct of any thesis or any dissertation which you have carried out so let us come to some examples so if the research question is, what is the burden of typhoid in Northeast Delhi? I've mentioned the O and the P because Dr. Rashmi has already apprised you uh, that a good research question has elements like the population problem or patient and the outcome along with the intervention or the comparator. But for certain studies, we would just be having the uh, patient population or problem that is the P and the O. These two are mandatory. Uh, to be there in each study. So we can select a design to uh, assess the burden of typhoid in Northeast Delhi. And this is a broad question. What design can we uh, use? We can go in for a descriptive observational study. 
the designs will be taught uh, in the later part of uh, this uh, webinar now we can frame an aim and now as i said a restatement of the title or the research question put into actionable ways so to study the burden of clinically diagnosed we are going to see clinically diagnosed typhoid fever in patients who present to one of the hospitals that is to gtb hospital of delhi as we want to see a representative population of northeast delhi and this is at best what we can do so now we have been a little more specific in stating our aim we need to find out what we intend to do what should be our outcomes if i think that uh, uh, to see clinically diagnosed cases of typhoid fever in my opd and out of uh, the total number of opds registrations which are there in uh, during the period of my study then my outcome measures could be stated as the number or the percentage of people uh, who are having clinically diagnosed typhoid fever from the total number of opd registrations in the given time frame it could be from my total number of admissions if that is what i intend to undertake if it could be about the number of deaths which have occurred uh, because of typhoid fever from all the deaths which have occurred in that time frame or it could be something about the positive cultures uh, from the clinically diagnosed cases or positive cultures from all the cultures which were done or it could be even about the cost incurred per patient who was diagnosed with typhoid so uh, we can have n number of outcomes it is up to the investigator to decide what is the primary outcome of interest what lacuna is he wishing to address so we can put up our objective depending on what the investigator intends to primarily investigate and then we can write to calculate the proportion per thousand uh, patient years of uh, patients of typhoid fever contributing to overall outpatient attendance so that becomes my primary objective because i intend to see the proportion uh, and my target population would be those who are coming to my opd so this is how we are trying to align our uh, aim our outcomes and our objectives to our research question the second which i tried to frame from uh, the speciality of anesthesia so you'll have to forgive me for the simplicity of the question so what is the efficacy of epidural analgesia for vaginal delivery and i believe that an experimental rct could be a good way of answering this question so i would now state my aim as to compare the efficacy which becomes my outcome of epidural analgesia versus spinal analgesia so i have an intervention i have a comparator for my population that is women who are undergoing vaginal delivery at my hospital now outcomes again there would be n number of ways to test the efficacy of epidural analgesia i can select one of these outcomes to uh of my interest and i can frame my primary objective to suit my primary outcome so my primary uh, objective could be to compare the time taken to achieve analgesic effect on administering epidural versus spinal analgesia for vaginal delivery so for my secondary objectives can be then based on the rest of the three outcomes and i can have three secondary objectives to answer the same question but my primary interest is to see whether the mean time to onset of analgesic effect is different between epidural and spinal analgesia again a third example to further exemplify we can see what is the role of typhoid m test for diagnosis of typhoid fever and this is a study which has been done to test for diagnostic accuracy in a cross sectional way so to ascertain the diagnostic accuracy of typhoid m against the gold standard because we are doing it for accuracy which happens to be the blood culture for early diagnosis of typhoid fever again the outcomes could be many i could be interested primarily in seeing what is the sensitivity and specificity of this test against uh, the gold standard what is the positive predictive value what is the negative predictive value so on and so forth so if at all i'm interested Uh, to a certain diagnostic accuracy then probably sensitivity and specificity should be part of my primary objective so i in clear actionable verbs i write to estimate 
the sensitivity and specificity of Typhi.m for diagnosis of typhoid fever. So for the rest of the outcome measures, we can frame secondary objectives. So the take home message from this presentation is that the research question, the aim, objectives, outcomes, and we can even add the research question, the title of your work, the aim, objectives, and outcomes, they should all be well aligned to each other. The aim is a restatement of the title, but you just put it by using certain actionable words before that. Objectives should definitely be smart, and it is good to have one primary objective and up to a maximum of three to four secondary objectives. And all outcomes, all measurable outcomes should be specified a priori. So please make it a habit. Whenever you are trying to write a research protocol, the outcomes need to be specified well beforehand. You cannot be deciding upon, depending on your results, what would be your primary outcome and what would be your secondary outcome. So these outcomes should be measurable and they should be specified a priori. And it is a very good habit to make a blueprint as I have uh, shown you the examples. So you can make a blueprint of uh, your title, your research, your research question, your title, your uh, aim, objectives, and your outcomes. And this would ensure alignment in the uh, long run. And it will keep your research work on track throughout the process of uh, you know, uh, doing your research. That's all about it. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Altna. Now I invite our next uh, speaker, Dr. Asha Tyagi. She is a director professor of anesthesiology in the Department of Anesthesiology and Critical Care, UCMS JTB Hospital. She has published over 100 research papers in various international and national index journals. And she is a section editor of JOCP, it's a national journal. <laughs> and she's the associate editor of BMC Anesthesiology, it's an international journal. She also a reviewer of a several international and national uh, journals. Her area of interest are critical care, obstetric anesthesia, and research methodology in anesthesia. She will talk on introduction and review of literature Dr. Asha, please. Thank you so much, sir, for the kind introduction. Am I audible, sir? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, so again, without uh, sounding repetitive, yes, this is courtesy uh, Medical Education Unit UCMS, where we hold uh, this and further deliberations quite regularly. And I thank all my colleagues for contributing towards it too. What is the objective of this session? To me, it's very simple, actually. If the majority of you are residents, then it is to help you write a correct and appropriate introduction and review of literature for your protocols, for your thesis. And for my other colleagues, yes, this should also help us in seeking uh, research grants for our research proposals. Is introduction really that important that we should spend time on it? Uh, let's assume you go for an evening out and your idea is to have fun that day. You reach the place of your get together. You're sitting in a corner. What do you want to do? You want to meet people. You want to socialize. How do you pick on people who are going to be uh, helping you spend that evening in a pleasurable and productive way? You go meet them and introduce yourselves or get introduced to them. And often it is the first one or two minutes which sets the pace for the entire evening. You will decide whether you want to have a further conversation. You will decide whether you want to spend the entire evening or not. Actually, it is very interesting to know that hello is a word which is present in most of the languages. That's the importance of introduction. It sets the tone. It sets the foundation. So even in research work, just reading that little introduction should be enough to convince your re reader that this research is important, that the research question is valid. Interestingly, <clears throat> I'm sorry, introduction is the first numbered page of your protocol. It will continue to be the first chapter of your thesis. You write a paper out of it. It continues to be the first section. 
but it is hardly 10% of your manuscript. The importance lies hence that I need to structure it and write it very well. If you answer four questions regarding your area of research work in the introduction sequentially, which means they should come in this particular order that we are going to talk about, chances are your introduction will be correct and highly relevant. Four questions, let's, like we said, finer for research question, we said smart for objectives, let's say IDNA, which doesn't mean much in itself, for an introduction. Importance, background, novelty, and aim. So with this sequence, what I'll do is I have tried to put up a little research area. So let's say I decide to work on the optimal dose of oxytocin for preventing PPH during cesarean delivery. Now, how do I introduce the importance of this area? Obviously, I need to convince my reader that PPH is important. How do I do that? Maybe I'd like to write its incidence, its prevalence, how much mortality it induces, what's the morbidity it causes, and hence the impact of the problem to my patient, to my healthcare, and the society. So that's the importance of this area of work. That is why importance in the introduction is often also called as a problem statement. Having introduced a little importance of the topic, I should go on to the background. When I say background, what does that mean? That means the existing literature. But remember, this is not a review of literature. So all I need to do is from this large picture I've tried to project, I should be able to divide the existing literature into what I know and what I don't know, which means the known, which is likely to be a large gray tiling that I show you, versus the unknown, which is likely to be a small little blueprint here. It is this unknown gap in the existing knowledge, which ultimately you should stop at when you're talking about your background. And this little gap will lead to your third step. Again, I go back to the uh, question I have posed that I decided to research the optimal dose of oxytocin for preventing PPH and cesarean. When I do a review of literature or I read what is existing, I, I divide it into known and unknown. I know about PPH, I know uterine atony is a common cause, I know it results in morbidity, mortality, I am aware about oxytocin. That's known. The only thing when you write this, you should remember, it should not be exhaustive. This is not an ROL. Unknown. When I was reading, I kind of come across and I realized that the data regarding the dosage in obese patients is very scanty. I could find, let's say, just one study. And further, it was never compared to non-obese patients. So this little blue tile, which was missing in the figure, becomes my gap. Having defined a gap, this should stem my next important step in the introduction, that's the novelty. This is what is going to fill the gap. So the novelty, which I would like to state is that this research will help determine the oxytocin dose requirement for obese patients during cesarean to prevent PPH. And how am I going to do this? So I end up with my aim, which Dr. Alpana has just stressed upon and uh, conveyed beautifully. So maybe my aim will be to evaluate this particular intraoperative dose requirement of oxytocin in the scenario we just described. So to recapitulate, when you do your introduction, Remember the four sequential questions you must answer. So importance of your area of work, the background, which means existing literature. Please do focus on the known and then the unknown or the gap. Stem a novelty from the gap and end up with an aim. So what I've done is I have put up the same research question we have been talking about. So the effective dose of oxytocin. And I I'm going to show you an introduction. Now, we can't have an interactive session per se, but what I'll do is I have fractionated this into a few paragraphs by paragraph. I'm going to read it out, and I want you to think, does this fit in into a correct and appropriate introduction or not? So the first paragraph is that the uterus is the female reproductive organ. This is how the introduction has been started. Okay. 
in the pelvis and it talks about the muscle layers, it talks about the columnar and epithelium after that, the arterial supply and so on and so forth. This first paragraph, does this relate to my research question in any way? No, so probably this was not required. Second paragraph, let's say I start saying that failure of the uterus to contract after delivery of fetus and placenta results in PPH and PPH is a major cause of morbidity, mortality and so on and so forth, its causes and I've referenced them. Just two lines, it's introduction, I've referenced them. Then I've gone on to say uh, a little bit about oxytocin. I'm referencing from the review and I'm writing that it is given as first line therapy. So says this particular guideline. There seems to be some uh, lack of consensus regarding its dose, timing, duration. Again, I've referenced it. And then I'm saying why it's important to give the right dose because there are a lot of side effects. Is this important to state? My guess would be yes, because this is the background which is talking about what is known. So first paragraph was the importance. Second paragraph about oxytocin is the background which is known. Then I'm going to talk about weight gain during pregnancy, how it's common, how the incidence of obesity is common, how very little is known about oxytocin dose during obesity. So yes, I'm happy to have this. This is again the known background. Then I lead you on, I lead the reader to come to a paragraph stating that despite these suggestions of you know, increasing weight gain and that uh, more oxytocin is required for labor induction, I couldn't find a study about. There is no previous study about uh, the dose during cesarean. And that one study I've written that there's no control group. So is this pertinent? Yes, this is the unknown. And I end up by saying that thus, we aim to evaluate the minimum effective dose of oxytocin in this particular circumstances. That's my aim, it's acceptable. So introduction is all right, background is all right, aim is all right. What did I miss? I didn't state a novelty. Novelty is my clinical usage. I should have stated that before the aim. So this is what the introduction we just scrutinized looks like eventually. Now, uh, writing in uh, sciences is actually a very different topic, but there are certain things we must remember. Firstly, English is not our native language. So how much ever fluent I may become in speaking, writing English remains a challenge for all of us especially when we are sending into international journals. The more you read in English, likely chances I'll get better at writing. Uh, but two or three important things, scientific writing always has to be in the active voice. What do I mean by that? I mean that I can say that this module is being taken by Dr. Asha, or I could say Dr. Asha is taking the module. Obviously the latter, where I have put myself as a subject in the beginning of the sentence is an active voice. It is more concise. It makes a greater impact. So stick to active voice. Second, break up your sentences. One sentence should not have more than one idea in it. Third, use strong verbs, not weak verbs like is, being done, has been. These are weak verbs. Don't use them and avoid over usage of saying, I did this, we did this, we did this. In methodology, it's an exception, but in introduction, results, discussion, avoid saying they did this, we did this. Avoid person pronouns. So this was introduction, four specific questions. Now the review of literature, it's longer. Let's say I'm going to take you through eight steps, which make an effective review of literature. When I talk about ROL, there are two different things. One is how to review the literature, and second is how to write it. Both are kind of interlaced, but they are different. I want to review literature. What literature? Scientific literature. What constitutes it? Of course, all journals with their scholarly articles. Of course, all annual meetings, conference proceedings. Of course, dissertations. Books, to some extent. Uh, which one should I look up for my research? Should I start from my textbook? Should I start from a journal? So it's good to divide my scientific literature into primary, secondary, and tertiary. Primary is all your journal-oriented things. They are recent. They are being investigated. We must look these up. Original research papers make sense to start. This gives rise to our secondary literature, which means maybe analysis, 
systematic reviews, meta-analysis, review articles, guidelines. These are derived from primary. So yes, these have to be seen. When there's a lot of data and there are no controversies, usually it enters textbooks. So textbooks are not a good place to look for gaps to conduct your research. That's your tertiary scientific literature. What is the first step to do an ROL? I have reviewed the literature. I know the source. First step should be, again, put your research question in front of you. Second, pick up keywords from it, which you are going to search literature in terms of. Today, literature search doesn't mean that I'm going to walk down to National Medical Library and look for one particular journal and one particular article, and most often you'll find that missing. Today, it means the click of a keyboard, which means you need the correct keyword, and you need to know where to search for, so the database. Database, it's a good idea to take one medical database, which is specific like PubMed, and one general, maybe Google Scholar, maybe Scopus, maybe Web of Science. Sometimes PubMed itself will give you so much you won't even need to extend to a general database. So I go back to my working uh, research question. Now I have put the research question in front of me. Step one, I pick up the keywords. What are the keywords? I want effective dose of oxytocin. I want cesarean, right? Initially, my first search. Maybe I'll add obesity later to it. Remember to search for synonyms. Maybe cesarean section is listed as cesarean delivery. Repeat your search. Maybe oxytocin, somebody has used a mesh keyword of eutrotonic. Repeat a search. Now, important thing, once I have decided, look at this example, I'm trying to prove a point. PubMed gives you a Mullerian search, which means what word you put between your keywords is very important. Let's say there are 5,000 articles in PubMed regarding oxytocin as a keyword, and there are 8,000 for cesarean. What do you want? You want those articles where oxytocin has been used in cesarean section. So you don't write oxytocin in cesarean. You need to write oxytocin and cesarean. And the mutually exclusive ones are going to be left out. And in the first window, you can see you end up with 2,400 results. It's not possible to read so many for anybody. Let me find, uh, refine my search. So I add and effective dose. Look at the other text box on the right. I come down to 320 results. So research question, keywords, I chose my database. I carried out the search, I narrowed it again. Another way to narrow it is, what can I do? I can put the filter in PubMed of the number of years. I'm not interested in research which was done 40 years back. It's obsolete. I want to see just maybe the last 10 years. So you narrow down your search to something which is workable. And with those 300, yes, I can read 300 titles and abstracts. So then I scan those for relevance and whatever relevant ones I'm left with, I need to take out the full text of those. So these five steps I have done. Should I start writing my ROI? Students are always so keen to write the ROL because every time they're taught, kuch nahi karna, just read the articles and put the abstracts. That's exactly what an ROL should not do. First, you sit down and you read those full texts. You understand them. You scrutinize those articles. And then you start making notes. What does that mean? Do I need to scribble on those articles? No. Take up an Excel sheet. One row belongs to one study. Put the name of the author, the identifying criteria for that study. And start writing all relevant points. Like for me, I would like to know that previous studies, okay, which particular patients did they take? What was their inclusion? Was obesity an exclusion? I would like to know how did they give oxytocin? Was it a bolus? Was it infusion? So I made a column for that. I need to know what was their sample size. And of course, I need to know their results. And always preserve this Excel sheet with you till you have finished your thesis. So once I've made this notes on my spreadsheets, now I will write the ROL. When you write the ROL, two, three important things. One, how do I arrange it? A lot of people like to do it chronologically, oldest to newest. If I was to say, okay, I'm going to put it like this, that in 1940, uh, PPH was discovered. And we came to know that PPH causes maternal mortality. In 1956, 
it was found out that uterine atony is the major cause and so on and so forth. It makes no sense to me. I'll be lost as a reader. So chronological presentation in your ROL might make sense when you're talking about discovery of, let's say, an equipment or discovery of a technique that, you know, I evolved from point A to B and B to C. Otherwise, in our anesthetic practice, most of the times it will make sense to arrange it thematically. What does thematically mean? Thematically means that I will um, section my ROL around broad topics or issues in an interlinked manner. So maybe I'll first pick up the studies about PPH and cesarean, then about oxytocin for PPH during cesarean, then those about obesity and its relationship with PPH. And last, I will say whatever that one little study is that uh, regarding oxytocin dose in obese patients. Lastly, when you write, I'm going to show you a group work exercise to see how you need to synthesize or write your review of literature. This is what typically students write it like and get it to us. X study, whoever author, studied the beneficial effects of cranberry extract for 10 years in workers of a chemical factory and found a 15% reduction in the risk of urinary bladder cancer. Then they'll state the second study and write, Y studied the protective effects of cranberry extract in industrial workers who were at risk of developing urinary bladder cancer. And after two years of this control study, they found no difference in the occurrence of carcinoma of urinary bladder in test and control group. It's nice to look at it. If I read it with the attempt to scrutinize, what does my mind tell me? My mind will tell me, okay, there are two studies. They seem to be contradicting each other. One is saying there was a 15% reduction in the cancer. Same cancer, same group of patients, right? Same intervention. They were seeing the uh, protective effects of cranberry extract. While the other says there was no difference. Why should this be? Oh, was it because they followed up patients for 10 years and one and two years for other? Right? So I think this, I analyze this. So in ROL, what I write is going to be what I just analyzed. So when I analyze, I want to write my ROL as two earlier studies have evaluated effect of cranberry extract in individuals at risk of developing urinary bladder cancer. I'll say that X found a 15% reduction in the study group compared to control group after studying cohort for 10 years. In contrast, Y studied similar groups at risk for two years with similar intervention, but failed to detect any risk reduction. And I'll add my interpretation or my critique that the difference in follow-up of the cohorts might explain the difference in the two results. So when you do your ROL, do not give just an article by article summary by copying and pasting the abstracts. Please read the full papers, evaluate them, arrange them thematically or conceptually, and try and give us a logical progression. In other words, this is another um, uh, analogy which is very useful, that when you cite studies in ROL, remember to compare and contrast, then offer your critique and make sure that you are connecting them with each other all the while. And with that, the take-home messages, introduction deserves attention and hard work. Remember the four components of introduction. And in ROL, your task is to build an argument and not a library. And that is all I'd like to say. With that, I thank you all for your patience hearing. Thank you, Dr. Asha. Now I invite our last and fourth speaker, Dr. Amir Maruf Khan. Dr. Amir is a professor uh, of community medicine in USMS and GTV hospital. He is the advisor biostatistics, Indian pediatrics and international journals uh, of diabetic in developing countries. And uh, he has many uh, research papers he has published in international and national journals. 
he will uh, talk on the common study designs. It's the last uh, topic of the today's important uh, subject. Now I invite Dr. Amir Maruf. Thank Please. you. Thank you, sir. Um, uh, thanks to ICA uh, and the anesthesia department and uh, especially Dr. Asha uh, for uh, inviting for this particular topic. Uh, before I uh, start my presentation, I would like to share a link of the paper that we have published on study designs. This was published in Indian Pediatrics in 2019. It is based upon a series of workshops that we have done on research methodology across India. So the topic is understanding and deciding an appropriate study design. So at the end of the presentation, we should be able to understand and choose an appropriate study design for other research objectives. Basically, if we start, we have two types of studies. The so whenever we start with the research question, first of all, we should ask this, that what is my research question? What am I doing in this? Am I just observing or am I intervening? These are the, this is the one first question that we should ask whenever we frame our research question. Now let us see a very simple example. There are two objectives given here. One is uh, the first one, prevalence of cataract in elderly population. And the second one is prevalence of peptic ulcer among elderly population by doing endoscopy. So what is this? Which is an observational study here and which is an experimental study here or interventional study? Because experimental or interventional or trial, they are synonyms when it comes to study designs. So this is, so second one, at times it is said that that is an interventional study, but there is a catch here. The second one is also an observational study. The endoscopy being done is a procedure and usually we say Ki, what is the intervention planned for the patient and there may be surgery, there may be other procedures that are planned, but that doesn't make it an interventional study. Inter it, it is an observational study, it becomes an interventional study when we are trying to change the outcome of the particular condition within the scope of the study. If we are trying to do that, here endoscopy is being done just to identify whether the patient has peptic, person has peptic ulcer or not. That's all. Study ends there. After that, the patient will be treated accordingly, but that is not a part of the study. Treatment what di uh, uh, how, what is the uh, patient ultimate outcome of the patient that is not the yes if the patient outcome is the um, uh, objective then we can say that it goes into the direction of interventional study so first and foremost we should be very clear about observational and experimental or interventional study so there's a three question approach uh, to study designs, which we are using and uh, we would like to share with you all. So what is, so let us look at the research question. What is the proportion of adults having peptic ulcer? Now let us see the three question approach. First question we should ask whenever we have an objective, a primary objective, or we have a research question we should ask, are we trying to modify or change to something new, then we will have to take a pause and say that, yes, this is an interventional study. We are trying to change the patient's outcomes. If not, if we are not trying to change patient outcome, then it is not an interventional study. It is an observational study. That is the first question that we should ask. Second, how many groups are there? So when we say, what is the proportion of adults having peptic ulcer? So there is only one group of patients, that is one group that is adults. Uh, some may say there may be male and female, there may be, uh, we can look at it as higher socioeconomic status and lower socioeconomic status or urban and rural and so on and so forth. But all those things are not here in this research question or the primary objective. They, they all can be there in the secondary objectives. The, you can do the subgroup analysis later on by 
looking at uh, how many males and how many females have peptic ulcer and you can compare also between these two but the primary the, the question that this study tries to address is not whether there is a difference in the peptic ulcer in males versus females it's not the, the the research question is very clear the proportion of adults who have peptic ulcer later on you can do any subgroup analysis that you can do but study design will remain for, for this particular case as a single group study and that is why it is called as a descriptive study but whenever we have two groups or more than one group as our main objective the main research question is to compare then we call it as a comparative study then the third question that we should ask is is the data collection being repeated from the same subjects after some time so if yes then it is longitudinal and if it is no we are we just want to see once whether what is the situation and that's all so it is a cross-sectional study so various combinations of these three questions happen whenever we look at the research question so the point is we should start from the research question we should not first start from key let us do a case control study and then start let us try to identify the problems and convert it into a research question as the previous speaker told and then see which study design will be appropriate for the particular research question now cross-sectional study suppose we find that milk drinking is associated with peptic ulcer we find that uh, those people who have peptic ulcer we find that they are uh, drink they were drinking more milk and those who were not having peptic ulcer they were drinking less milk so what does this mean at times we think that this means that maybe milk drinking uh, those who are uh, having peptic ulcer they are we are seeing that they are drinking more milk so milk drinkers are more in that so it means that the milk drinking may be leading to peptic ulcer so we don't know in a cross-sectional study what is leading to what whether milk drinking is leading to peptic ulcer or whether peptic ulcer is leading a person towards drinking more milk maybe as uh, having a soothing effect so in a cross-sectional study we don't know the directionality what is causing what that is why we can't say which is the risk factor and which is the outcome in a cross-sectional study we can just say that we found that these two things are associated that's all if we want to see what is the causative agent then we will have to do a longitudinal study in order to establish that now let us look at an example from the anesthesia by, uh, background now to identify this is an objective i've written here to identify what proportion of patients during the pre-operative anesthetic clinic re report as experiencing fear of anesthesia now in this case uh, if we use the three question approach then what we will find is that the first question was let us go to the first question are we modifying or changing to something new now let us look at this question here we are just trying to find out what proportion of patients in the pre-op anesthetic clinic they report as they are having the fear of anesthesia so here we are not trying to change we are just trying to observe so that is why it is not an interventional study it is just an observational study so that is the first question that we answered let us look at the second question do we have more than one group let us look at the objective is there more than one group in the uh, main objective we find what proportion of patients so it's a single group of patients later on yes you can do subgroup analysis but that is let us not confuse with that here it is a single group so that is why it is a so it is a it is a, a descriptive study it's an observational study and uh, then the third question was that are we following up the patient repeating some measurements over a period of time here we are not because we are just measuring the um, what is the level of uh, fear of anesthesia by maybe different scales and we are just trying to find it out so it's only one time observation that we are doing so it's a cross-sectional study not a longitudinal study so these are the basic terminology that you should be aware of observational this is observational descriptive and cross-sectional study so the take-home message is whenever there are you want to estimate some proportion some mean 
then it is a cross-sectional study. So whenever you see a research question which is trying to estimate something, you can immediately say that most likely it should be a cross-sectional study. Now we go on to the next question. What are the predictive values of preoperative tests for dif difficult laryngoscopy and intubation among surgical patients who underwent elective surgery under general anesthesia with endotracheal intubation? Now, what do we want to find out? We want to find out the predictive values of pre-op tests. So we are doing pre-op tests, suppose, for uh, difficult laryngoscopy, and we want to say whether uh, we are uh, doing it right. So we doing some pre-op test, we say that this will this is going to be a difficult laryngoscopy. And actually what happens, uh, we will see that. So first, we will, so this is trying to find out, uh, trying to predict something in uh, the this particular condition. Now let us use the same three questions and try to find out uh, whether uh, what type of study design this is. Now, what we will find out ultimately when we will be using this, uh, doing the study is that out of those who were found to have difficult uh, uh, endotracheal intubations actually uh, during the uh, elective surgery, they will be, uh, and how many we were able to predict correctly. So this is what we call it as sensitivity. So you must be remembering sensitivity and specificity. This is sensitivity that what is the, uh, how many were uh, actually uh, uh, having difficult uh, endotracheal intubations and how many, how many of them were, we were able to predict by the particular uh, preoperative test. So that is called as sensitivity. So in this case, if you see, are we modifying or changing to something new? Are we trying to change the patient outcome? No, we are just trying to find out that using our test before the surgery that uh, to predict how many will be having difficult intub uh, endotracheal intubations. So this is an observational study. Second question, do we have more than one group? We have, we, we look at sensitivity and specificity separately. So in sensitivity, we say that those who had difficult intubations actually, uh, how many of them uh, we were able to detect by applying a pre-op test? And so in this, we are only using one group, that is those uh, patients where endotracheal intubations were really difficult. And in specificity, we consider those patients where endotracheal intubations were not difficult. So sensitivity, when we want to find out sensitivity, there is one group. When we, find out, when we want to find out specificity, there is one group. And we don't compare sensitivity and specificity. We uh, quote, mention, sensitivity separately and specificity separately. So here it is only one group. So that is why it becomes a descriptive study. Secondly, uh, is the data collection being repeated from the same subject after some time? Here there is no need. You just do a pre-op test, that's all. And then uh, when the surgery happens, you see whether it is actually difficult or not. So no particular data collection method is being repeated from the same subject after some, uh, some time. So, so that becomes a cross-sectional study. All the diagnostic studies, screening studies are uh, cross-sectional studies. They are observational studies. They are descriptive studies. So by writing cross-sectional studies, that takes care of all the things. Cross-sectional studies are, uh, they are observational and they are descriptive also. So no need to add those words, but we should be clear in our heads what we are doing here. Next, uh, Question, uh, what is the change in the cognitive function among children uh, of a particular age group uh, who underwent general anesthesia for elective surgery? So what are we doing here is we are testing the cognitive function of children, then they undergo general anesthesia, then we later on we find out that whether it has changed or not. So this is a research question. What is the study design? Let us use the three question approach and try to find out. Are we changing to something new? Are we changing the patient outcome here? So here we are not doing, we are just doing a, uh, there is a, a cognitive function we are measuring. Then once, then we are, the patient is undergoing uh, some surgery and anesthesia. And then uh, afterwards we again see whether the cognitive function we measure and we see whether there's a change or not. So we are not trying to intervene any way in, in changing the patient's outcome. So this is just an observational study. 
then do we have more than one group so here if we see there is only one group children aged of uh, of a particular age group that's all so this is a uh, descriptive now is the data collection being repeated from the same subjects after some time what we find here is you have to find the change in cognitive function so you will have to measure the cognitive function in the these children at least twice so the moment you are repeating the same test twice in the same person then it becomes a longitudinal study so this research question will be uh, addressed by observational uh, descriptive and longitudinal study design so whenever we have to want to find out prognosis how the uh, uh, what is the uh, how the disease evolves or uh, what is the how the condition evolves over a period of time that is always a longitudinal survey now there are other question, research question let us look at the, this research question now this research question is what is the association between the use of a particular uh, tool in endotracheal intubation and uh, this particular condition now using a particular tool how it is associated with a particular outcome so this is uh, the research question so on one side we have a potential risk factor uh, that is this tool that is uh, that is being used in endotracheal intubation and the other other side uh, there is the outcome that we expect so we we want to see whether these two are associated or not now how will we approach this research question we can approach this research question one group we will use this tool in another group we will not use this tool and then we will see what is the in uh, those uh, patients in whom we use this stylet uh, how many suffered from this outcome in the other group where we didn't use this uh, stylet how many suffered from uh, the outcome so then we can compare so we start with two groups uh, where one group has is using the is having the risk factor stylet here in this case another group where this uh, risk factor is not there and that is the stylet in this case and then you try to see so two groups you form based on the risk factor present or risk factor absent and so this is one way in which you can compare whether there is an association or not you can also compare in this way you have some uh, patients uh, who had uh, post operative this uh, arytenoid dislocation this condition and another group which doesn't have this condition and then you can compare with uh, how many of those which uh, were suffering from this condition uh, in which they give a history of uh, using the stylet and in the other group how many of those who didn't have this how many were giving the history of using this stylet so here we are making two groups based on the outcome that is a condition that is a disease that is a um, uh, so uh, what we say is the effect so one is the risk factor and one is the outcome in simple words we use these terms if you form two groups in your study based on risk factor it is a cohort study if you form two groups in your study based on the outcome or the disease here in this case arytenoid dislocation if you do that then it becomes a case control study so this is in simple terms uh, if you if you are forming case control studies where you have uh, illness yes and no so you are making two groups you can see in the blue box in between the two boxes illness yes and no or the outcome yes or no then it becomes a case control study so what is a case control study look what is happening actually is so you can ask the three questions again are we changing to something different are we changing the outcome of the patient in this case no we are not changing the outcome in one group stylet is being used in another uh, in one group arytenoid dislocation has happened in another group the dislocation is not there we are just asking whether they were using stylet in the other group also how many uh, cases were uh, stylets were used so what happened this is an observational study now do we have more than one group yes we have more than one group the groups are based on outcome or the uh, disease or the uh, effect so what happens is that this is a comparative study and the third question is the data collection being repeated from the same subject after some time no the data collection is not being repeated you just ask once whether stylet was used or not and in the other group also you ask like that so it becomes a cross-sectional so all case control studies uh, most most of the case control studies i will say are uh, treated as observational they are comparative studies 
and they are cross-sectional studies. So in the background, this is what is this is what is happening in a case control study. Uh, but if you take two groups based on the risk factor or the stylet used in this case, so if the stylets were used, you form one group. If the stylet is not used, you form another group, and then you see uh, that what is the uh, proportion of one group uh, having the outcome that is the dislocation and another group having dislocation and you compare this then it becomes a cohort study again cohort study also you can ask this question this type of uh, so if you are doing uh, this type of thing you are dividing into two groups so one is uh, first question is are you modifying or changing to something new so you are uh, just observing in one group anyways the tool was used in another group that stylet was not used so that is how if it is going so you just collect uh, whatever is happening in the operation theater you just uh, go and take the records that okay these people were in this people these stylets were used in these uh, patient stylets were not used and then you go and ask uh, find out how many of them suffered this dislocation and then you compare it it's a, just an observational study do we have more than one group? Yes, we are making two groups based on the risk factor that is the stylet the used or not used. That is why it is a cohort study because you are making two groups based on risk factor. So it's a comparative study, no doubt. And the last question is the data collection being repeated from the same subject after some time. Now, in cohort study, you have to first see that before the, the before the operation, before the surgery, the patient should not be having the uh, arytenoid dislocation because it will confound the result. So if there's the patient that before the surgery, the patient was not having the arytenoid dislocation. And then you see after the stylet was used, what was the outcome? So you will have to find out whether the patient was suffering from the outcome before the uh, tool was used or not. That also you have to see. So that is why in this case, it is a longitudinal study because you have to see, uh, see the change that is happening that before the stylet was used, there was no dislocation. After the stylet was used, there was dislocation or not. So when you want to see the same characteristic in the same patient for at least two times, it is called as cohort study or longitudinal. So causal association, whenever you want to find out the association between two groups, uh between risk factor and outcome then you can do either a case control or a cohort study and the last and the most popular one amongst i think anesthesia also is uh, randomized control trials trials interventional studies uh what is the influence of uh, anesthesia the part, one particular anesthesia part versus another anesthesia on uh, some outcome so here if you see uh if you see the first question are we changing to something new so by using two different types of anesthesia we are trying to see whether there's a change in patient outcome or not within the study and wherever you are trying to change the patient outcome within your study it becomes an interventional study or a trial or an uh, experimental study so this is an interventional study now the three question approach uh the other two question changes here now, whenever you have an interventional study, the second question becomes, do we have more than one group? So you can have a trial or an experimental study in one group only. That is called a single arm trial. You just see before and after that's all. Uh, so that is one thing. Second, if it is a comparative study, if it is a controlled study, uh, randomization has been done or not. That becomes your third question. So if randomization is done, then it is randomized. If not, then non-randomized or quasi-experimental, we call it as. So these are the three questions we have to ask whenever uh, we have an interventional study. These questions are applicable. So whenever we want to find of effectiveness or the change, uh, some change in the therapy or some procedure of a particular uh, in a particular setting, then we call it as a, uh, mostly we use randomized control trial, but it can be non-randomized control trial also it can be a single arm trial also without having a comparator this is a schematic presentation of how uh, you allot into two groups and then you compare the results so take home messages are this that you if you have estimation you can uh, safely say that it will be answered by cross-sectional study if you are into diagnosis like uh, tests like uh, validity uh, sensitivity, specificity at all, then you can safely say that it will be answered by cross-sectional studies. If you want to find out prognosis or change, 
how it is happening over a period of time. You just do longitudinal studies. If you want to find out association between risk factor and outcome, you try to do either a cohort or case control study, it depends on how you form the two groups. And lastly, if you want to find out the effectiveness of any therapy of any procedure, you can do a trial intervention study, which can be single arm trial. You can we have a comparator group, a control trial, you, uh, and then you can also have randomized or a non-randomized trial also. All these combinations are available. So that's all, but lastly, I would like to just say that uh, in uh, study designs, uh, we have uh, earlier uh, studied, we say that uh, systematic reviews are the best, randomized control trials are the best, and so on. And then in the hierarchy, we say that cross-sectional studies come at last, and then case series and all those things. But uh, we should not fall in that trap. No study is best and no study is worst. No study is good and no study is bad. We have to find out which study design is most appropriate for our research question and if it is so you we should use the terms which is appropriate study design and which is not an appropriate study design rather than going into the category of good and bad thank you very much very much and if there are any questions i'm happy to uh, try to respond thank you thank you uh, thank you dr amir first of all i want to thank all the four speakers for delivering a very detailed and informative talk on the various parts of the research methodology. And uh, I think uh, today's all the participants must have learned something very important, uh, the, the <clears throat> aspects and important uh, parts and uh, important others. Uh, now I invite Dr. Asha for a question answer session. Thank you. Uh right thank you sir so from what i can see i have first uh, two questions the first says that how to rephrase scientific facts to avoid plagiarism uh how to rephrase is not the question the question is that you need to avoid plagiarism so as we were trying to say the moment you are going to critique studies and the moment you are going to apply your own understanding of it and then write it, chances are plagiarism will be lesser. That is my first take on it. And secondly, of course, you have plagiarism um, tools nowadays to check and you have percentages allowed, which you must take care about. In the same tone for plagiarism, it also does not mean that I can copy paste exact sentences and just put a reference at the end and then it is not plagiarism. It is. So that is my take on it. If any of the other speakers wishes to add on how to avoid plagiarism while rephrasing, I think we could uh, contribute more. Dr. Amir, Alpina, uh, Rashmi, anybody. I think plagiarism mostly arises because we are not applying your mind to it and you are just choosing to copy paste in your ROLs and your introduction as it was so anything else to add just one more word ma'am uh, to avoid sure. plagiarism it's important as we had stressed upon that uh, uh, whatever articles that we are accessing and uh, quoting as references for our ROL, they should ideally be read in total and uh, it is only then that it becomes possible to provide a critique and to compare and contrast between similar studies so uh, once that is done uh, probably this uh, problem of how to rephrase would uh, in itself be uh, decimated yes it would be a mute question really that's what we've been trying to say that it is not about picking up and putting things it's about reading interpreting analyzing and then writing so that's all we and that was the only question i found in the chat box both are uh, related to plagiarism uh, so if that is all, I'd uh, like to thank the Indian College of Anesthetists on everybody's behalf. Thank you so much, sir, for having us here. And I'd like to invite Dr. Baljeet Singh, sir, to please render the um, further proceedings. So. Thank you so much, Dr. Asha. I must compliment uh, both of you for uh, uh, great uh, moderation of uh, a very interesting topic, which uh, uh, somehow uh, is assuming more and more uh, importance these days because uh, it's, it's uh, very necessary for any student 
uh, of not only of anesthesia or maybe medicine, surgery, or which, which I was special because we must understand these basic facts because without this, we'll have a lot of uh, flaws in our uh, conduct of the study. And of course, if you are uh, thinking of writing in uh, a manuscript, we will have a lot of weaknesses there and it will it is likely to be rejected. It's only with a very strong background and a very robust design that we have uh, about the study, that the study will be getting some respect from the editors. Otherwise, they will just send it back. Sorry, you know, try next time. We'll be happy to have your uh, manuscript next time. Well, thanks for your submission to uh, this uh, journal, and uh, we look forward to more from that. So that kind of supply would be coming. So uh, all the four speakers did a wonderful job, and uh, <clears throat> I think uh, if, if I break this uh, seminar into four uh, different parts, which the four different speakers uh, covered was uh, first is to uh, generate a question as to what we are trying to do, what uh, we are looking at, what are we trying to prove, and then of course the aim, uh, objectives, outcome measures. How are we going to do that? And then of course uh, Dr. Prasha went on for. A view of literature. I like the statement which she uh, ended up her talk with. That was to uh, the view of literature is to build a point, build a case, and it's not just uh, develop a library. So that was a very apt uh, statement to conclude her talk. And uh, of course, common study designs, uh, Dr. Maruf uh, explained very nicely, which are uh, longitudinal study, which is a cohort study, which is a you know uh, observational study, which is a descriptive study. I think uh, we uh, all, all these uh, uh, things that have been discussed today in this uh, webinar would be very, very useful and very, very handy for uh, the student because those who are studying today, tomorrow they'll be coming into, uh, into, into the profession as independent sociologists and would be working in different institutions where they may have colleagues whom they, are, uh, they would like to guide uh, for their research work. And I'm sure this will be very, very helpful. So thank you so much, uh, all the four speakers, uh, Dr. Rashmi, Dr. Altuna Raizada, Dr. Asha Kagi, of course, and Dr. Maruf uh, Amir Khan. And of course, uh, to my uh, dear friends, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Otela and Dr. Asha Kagi for wonderful moderation of uh, uh, the webinar. It's, it's a unique webinar, as I told you in the beginning, but this is something that we very uh, much need to do. So on behalf of Indian College of Anesthesiologists, I thank you once again and look forward to uh, having you again on this platform. So till we meet again uh, next Wednesday. So stay healthy, stay happy. God bless you all. Bye-bye and good night. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Good night, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Where is uh, that lady? She can close down this now. Yes, sir. I'll, I'll just be closing, sir. Yeah, please do that. Right. Thank you, sir. Uh, Ms. Ankita, can we just uh, uh, leave the meeting or? We'll do it. Right. Ms. Ankita? Yes, sir. Yeah, kindly close the session. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for a kind cooperation. With all your permissions, we are concluding the session over here. Thank, Thank you. you.